Now welcome to Plato's Pod, where we engage in a group discussion on selections from the complete works of Plato, the philosopher and geometer who wrote nearly 2,400 years ago. Today is October 8th, 2023, and I'm your host, James Myers. It's an honor to welcome in discussion members from the Toronto, Calgary, and Chicago philosophy meetup groups. Whether you've been with us before or are here for the first time, whether you have experience with or are new to Plato's works, I encourage you to add your voice to our dialogue. So this podcast began in 2021 by discussing the Timaeus, and today we're revisiting the first part of Plato's dialogue on the creation of the universe, covering from the beginning to 30D. I've posted selections from the reading on the shared drive linked to the event notice on meetup.com, as well as two questions to focus our discussion. To contribute your thoughts, please use the raise hands feature in Zoom. And for everyone's benefit, please relate your comments and opinions to Plato's text. So that everyone has a chance to speak, I'll call on you in the order that hands are raised, using first name only. Once we finish recording in two hours, I invite anyone who wishes to remain online for Plato's Cafe, a casual half-hour discussion on Plato or philosophy in general. So the beginning of the Timaeus features a recounting by Socrates and the character Timaeus of the previous day's discussion that was the subject of Plato's epic on justice and political organization, the Republic. The dialogue then shifts to the character Critias, who relates the story of the struggle between Athens and Atlantis that the ancient Athenian statesman Solon learned from an Egyptian priest. Plato introduced two important pieces of knowledge to the world in the Timaeus. One of these is the legend of Atlantis that we'll encounter today, and the other is the existence of the only five regular geometric solids in the universe that we now call Platonic solids, which we'll discover in four weeks when we get to 53a, where Timaeus explains universal geometry of depth. So one of the two questions I want to ask about today's reading is, why did Plato begin this dialogue on the creation of the universe with stories of three cities, the imagined city of the Republic, the ancient city of Athens, and its nemesis, the technologically powerful city of Atlantis? Regarding the city the characters imagined in their meeting of the previous day, the one that Plato wrote about in the Republic, Socrates declares at 19d, I charge myself with being quite unable to sing fitting praise to our city and its men. So how does this discussion and the tale of Athens and Atlantis relate to the purpose of the Timaeus, which is to address the creation of the universe? The other question I want to ask today has to do with the division of the universe that the astronomer Timaeus describes at 28a. There he distinguishes two separate parts of the universe. One is the infinite, unchanging, timeless realm of being that always exists and is accessible to our minds, but not to our physical senses. The other part is the continually changing realm of the physical limits that never exists, but is always in a dynamic state of becoming that's measured by our five physical senses. My question is, does this division bear any relationship to our modern understanding of physics, or can science now refute this as a universally fundamental division? So to address the first question, I'll begin today's discussion with a reading from 17c to 19d, which I have here on the screen, in which Socrates and Timaeus review the imagined city of the Republic, and then we'll listen to the Egyptian priest telling Solon of lost memories of ancient civilizations and the story of Atlantis. So 17c starts with Socrates. He says, very well. I talked about politics yesterday, and my main point, I think, had to do with the kind of political structure cities should have and the kind of men that should make it up so as to be the best possible. Didn't we begin by separating off the class of farmers and all the other craftsmen in the city from the class of those who were to wage war on its behalf? And we followed nature in giving each person only one occupation, one craft for which he was well suited. And so we said only those whose job it was to wage war on everyone's behalf should be guardians of the city. And if some foreigner or even a citizen were to go against the city to cause trouble, these guardians should judge their own subjects lightly, since they are their natural friends. But they should be harsh, we said, with the enemies they encountered on the battlefield. That's because, as I think we said, the guardian souls should have in nature that is at once both spirited and philosophical to the highest degree, to enable them to be appropriately gentle or harsh as the case may be. What about their training? Didn't we say that they were to be given both physical and cultural training, as well as training in any other appropriate fields of learning? And here's uh, Timaeus interjects, we certainly did. Socrates goes on, yes, and we said, I think, that those who receive this training shouldn't consider gold or silver or anything else as their own private property. Like the professionals they are, 
they should receive from those under their protection a wage for their guardianship that's in keeping with their moderate way of life. And we said that they should share their expenses and spend their time together, live in one another's company, and devote their care above all to excellence, now that they were relieved of all their other occupations. Timaeus interjects again, yes, we said that as well. And Socrates goes on, and in fact, we even made mention of women. We said that their nature should be made to correspond with those of men, and that all occupations, whether having to do with war or those other aspects of life, should be common to both men and women. Timaeus says, yes, that too was discussed. And Socrates says, and what do we say about the procreation of children? We couldn't possibly forget that subject, because what we said about it was so unusual. We decided that they should all have spouses and children in common, and that schemes should be devised to prevent any one of them from recognizing his or her own particular child. Every one of them would believe that they all make up a single family, and that all who fall within their own age bracket are their sisters and brothers, that those who are older who fall in an earlier bracket are their parents and grandparents, while those who fall in a later one are their children or grandchildren. Timaeus says, you're right, that certainly was an unforgettable point. And Socrates continues, and surely we also remember saying, don't we, that to make their natures as excellent as possible right from the start, the rulers, male and female, should secretly arrange marriages by lot, to make sure that good men and bad ones would each as a group be separately matched up with women like themselves? And we said that this arrangement wouldn't create any animosity among them, because they believed that the matching was due to chance? Timaeus says, yes, we remember. And Socrates continues, and do we also remember saying that the children of the good parents were to be brought up, while those of the bad ones were to be secretly handed on to another city? And that those children should be constantly watched as they grow up, so that the ones that turned out deserving might be taken back again, and the ones they kept who did not turn out that way should change places with them? We did say so, said Timaeus. Socrates concludes, All right, I'd like to go on now and tell you what I've come to feel about the political structure we've described. My feelings are like those of a man who gazes upon magnificent-looking animals, whether they're animals in a painting or even actually alive, but standing still, and who then finds himself longing to look at them in motion or engaged in some struggle or conflict that seems to show off their distinctive physical qualities. I felt the same thing about the city we've described. I'd love to listen to someone give a speech depicting our city in a contest with other cities, competing for those prizes that cities typically compete for. I'd love to see our city distinguish itself in the way it goes to war and in the way it pursues the war, that it deals with the other cities one after another in ways that reflect positively on its own education and training, both in word and deed, that is, both in how it behaves toward them and how it negotiates with them. Now, on these matters, Critias and Hermocrates, I charge myself with being quite unable to sing fitting praise to our city and its men. That this should be so in my case isn't at all surprising. But I have come to have the same opinion of the poets, our ancient poets as well as today's. I have no disrespect for poets in general, but everyone knows that imitators as a breed are best and most adept at imitating the sort of things they've been trained to imitate. So that was the opening uh, from 17D to, 17C to 19D of Plato's Timaeus, in which he refers back to the discussion in the Republic, which was the second longest of Plato's works. Um, and we covered the Republic in season two in six episodes. Um, so I'm just curious here. So we have here a dialogue about the creation of the universe, the Timaeus, and then this kind of protracted discussion about what they had been discussing the day before, the political uh, and social structure of this kind of idealized city that Socrates ends up saying that he has trouble imagining it in motion and he can't sing the praises of it. Are there any thoughts on what the purpose of this review of what was said in the Republic is uh, here in this dialogue about the creation of the universe? I think there's one one thing that, uh, especially in that last sentence, when Socrates says, everyone knows that imitators as a breed are best and most adept at imitating the sort of things they've been trained to imitate. He does talk, uh, or there is talk in this dialogue about how there's the universe of being, which is the second part of today's dialogue that we'll look at, 
and there is the universe of becoming. So the universe is divided into two parts. The universe of becoming, which is the physical universe, uh, as Timaeus will explain, is an imitation. It's it's a copy uh, of the static universe of being, the, the ever-present universe of being. So this universe of becoming that we live in, physically live in, is always changing. And I think maybe this... This is a reference to that sort of imitation in this uh, universe of becoming. So any thoughts on, on the position of this? And then why does he go on to talk about Atlantis? So this myth of Atlantis, which has endured for 2,400 years, ever since Plato first wrote about it, it's a powerful myth. And again, what how does that belong in this dialogue about the creation of the universe? Let me go on to read that part about Atlantis. So the part that I just read is about the city that was imagined in the Republic, the city that Socrates and the others had discussed the previous night, that kind of idealized city that Socrates says uh, he has trouble imagining coming into motion or actually you know, physically existing. And then here, they will talk about another city. And this is the character Critias talking about this relating an ancient story of Solon. They, they hailed as the founder of the Greek democracy, who was about, I think, 200 years earlier than Plato. Uh, and I think Solon was said to be a an ancestor of Plato. So this part, I'll just read from 22b to 23b, is about another city, the city of Atlantis. The story uh, goes that, that a priest met with Solon and this is the discussion that happened between the, the priest and so on, as Critias relates it. And then one of the priests, a very old man, said, Ah, Solon, Solon, you Greeks are ever children. There isn't an old man among you. On hearing this, Solon said, What? What do you mean? You are young, the old priest replied, young in soul, every one of you. Your souls are devoid of beliefs about antiquity handed down by ancient tradition. Your souls lack any learning made hoary by time. The reason for that is this. There have been, and there will continue to be, numerous disasters that have destroyed human life in many kinds of ways. The most serious of these involve fire and water, while the lesser ones have numerous other causes. And so also among your people, the tale is told that Phaethon, child of the sun, once harnessed his father's chariot, but was unable to drive it along his father's course. He ended up burning everything on the earth's surface and was destroyed himself when a lightning bolt struck him. This tale is told as a myth, but the truth behind it is that there is a deviation in the heavenly bodies that travel around the earth, which cause huge fires that destroy what is on earth across vast stretches of time. When this happens, all those people who live in the mountains or in places that are high and dry are much more likely to perish than the ones who live next to the rivers or by the sea. On the other hand, whenever the gods send floods of water upon the earth to purge it, the herdsmen and shepherds in the mountains preserve their lives, while those who live in cities in your region are swept by the rivers into the sea. Now all of the events reported to us, no matter where they have occurred, in your parts or ours, if there are any that are noble or great or distinguished or in some other way, they have all been inscribed here in our temples and preserved from antiquity on. In your case, on the other hand, as in that of others, no sooner have you achieved literacy and all the other resources that cities require than there again, after the usual number of years, comes the heavenly flood. It sweeps upon you like a plague and leaves only your illiterate and uncultured people behind. You become infants all over again, as it were, completely unfamiliar with anything that was in ancient times, whether here or in your own region. And so, so on, the account you just gave of your people's lineage is just a nursery tale. First of all, you people remember only one flood, though in fact there had been a great many before. Second, you are unaware of the fact that the finest and best of all races of humankind once lived in your region. So that's how the legend of Atlantis gets introduced, this finest and best of all races of humankind once lived in your region. So, Clem, your thoughts on, uh, on the introduction, these two parts that I've read? Right. Uh, thank you for reading uh, these couple of passages. They sort of refreshed, uh, helped me refresh my mind uh, about the passage on Atlantis and also kind of gave an introduction to how this, this whole dialogue started 
with, you know, talking on social issues, the, I guess, the state policy and so on. I'll have to be honest, I don't know why Plato in this particular dialogue, he, he starts that way. I do have a guess, but I'm not like 100% sure. Um, and that guess is that um, he's trying to set stage. Maybe it's sort of a, like an, an emotional impetus that he sends to to the group to maybe set their subconscious uh, to, to certain uh, tone of the of what's going to follow later on, because they're about to approach some serious metaphysical issues there. But he starts with this idea that the world that we live in is impermanent and it's prone to disasters. Uh, and also there is the, a great uh, history that uh, it kind of follows that, that precedes their times uh, of which they've heard and have some you know re remnants of. And they basically, he sets the stage by saying that the world that we live in is, it changes all the time. And that's going to have uh, some connection to the second realm of the reality that they're talking about. Uh, the, the one that Timaeus says that it's, it pretty much doesn't exist. And so that's one thing. And another thing is that they apparently, there have you know been thoughts prior to their time, the humanity thought, or the beings that lived prior to their time, apparently they you know they had some culture and some history, and so they they knew some things, and so they're trying maybe to attune themselves to maybe to to the prior history, you know, prior knowledge. What they they try to contemplate what you know what potentially what those human beings that lived before them could have thought how they viewed the world, what transpired. Prior to their time, he, he talks about the two counterpart cities that survived after the Atlantis. Uh, and it's interestingly that he noticed uh, the priest in Egypt uh, makes this comment that the city in Greece, the Athens, is actually older and even used to be more powerful than its counterpart city in Egypt. But they apparently they didn't keep their record straight mm -hmm. uh but uh the the city in Egypt somehow they were maybe not as as glorious warriors but they were more of a kind of priestly type of people they had the knowledge they at least try to gather the knowledge after the cataclysm mm -hmm. uh and so they try to keep their record straight as much as they could and so there's this again he sets the stage because, because it's always about the polarities right there's a polarity of the two different realms different cities, different civilizations, different approaches to how you think about history and culture and so on. Mm -hmm. so, so these are my thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I, I think that you touched on a number of points that you started by talking about kind of the setting the emotional stage maybe for this, uh, that kind of connection between people in, in some sort of historical context uh, with respect to the universe. And I think that really points to maybe the words that uh, are used at the beginning of that second passage that I read, the one where the priest is speaking to Solon, and the priest starts talking about soul. You know, he says, you are young in soul, every one of you, your souls are devoid of, of beliefs about antiqu antiquity, your souls lack any learning made hoary by time. And I think that may be a clue to the connection here that, you know, and it's something that Socrates is constantly addressing is the role of the soul. Um, and now, so we live in a universe that is, it's a physical universe. I mean, it consists of physical things, our bodies, but it also consists of things that are not physical, which would be our souls. And so maybe in the construction of the universe, he's really trying to say, well, the universe is constructed for the physical, but also for the metaphysical, the, the the soul, that which is not physical. Uh, and I think that may be an, an important point here that's, that's important in, in determining how people actually operate with respect to one another. You know, so that very, you know, long construction of this imagined city in the Republic, it's a kind of a template for a city, but is that template actually one that would work with real live souls? 
And so I think in the construction of the universe, we have to consider not just how the physical elements of the universe operate, but also how the souls operate, you know, the, that, in that part inside us, which is the animating force. And that is a part of the universe as well. So the universe is not just physical, I think is what he's saying here. So thank you for that. And uh, we'll go to Darren. Hey, everyone. So regarding what this legend of Atlantis, the myth of Atlantis has to do with, you know, all the metaphysics that's coming up later, um, you know, with the creation of the universe and all that. I think that's an excellent question <laughs> and something to really ponder. So I, I'll just give this one particular thought now. Maybe I can bring up other things later. But I wonder if, because we'll see later, that the metaphysical discourse that's coming later, that when Timaeus jumps in, is pretty long-winded and dry, <laughs> at least for many people. I mean, maybe some people <laughs> love those uh, that really long speech about you know the parts of the universe but i think for a lot of readers you know especially those used to maybe like the republic or the ethical dialogues it's gonna get pretty uh taxing and so i wonder if he sort of sandwiches between he sandwiches between these sections about atlantis because we know what comes after timaeus's speech is the next dialogue critias and i haven't read that one but like Apparently, that's like where Atlantis comes back <laughs> into the picture, uh, where Critias jumps into the the conversation again. So I wonder if he's trying to entice us to read the metaphysics by wow. sort of placing it in this interesting mythical context. And I think one consideration for why this explanation is plausible is that I think Plato is very concerned with wonder. Like we saw in the Theotetus, the dialogue on what is knowledge that, you know, there's this great metaphor about wonder you know, is related to rainbow or something. I don't remember the exact details, but um, there's this great metaphor he uses about basically wonder being the start of philosophy and knowledge. Um, if you don't have wonder, like you're somehow just like, you know, you might just be memorizing things by rote, you know, in which case we might wonder whether you truly have understanding or knowledge. Um, yeah. So the importance of wonder and, um, so we see that explicitly in the Theotetus, but also in all the dialogues, right? Pretty much all of them, at least. I, I think Plato's trying to get both his interlock, both the Socrates and talk interlocutors interested and curious and wanting to talk more. And depending on the personality, it requires sort of like different moves by Socrates to get them interested. Sometimes it's really direct challenge. Sometimes it's just raising questions. Um, you know, he, sometimes he's talking to sophists. Sometimes he's talking to children. So we, Socrates does different things to get people talking and curious. And of course, that's by extension, Plato trying to get us, the reader, interested and curious about philosophy because Plato is really concerned with preserving philosophy and continuing philosophy beyond his own death. So I think there, I think there is a case to be made that maybe he sort of puts this very long-winded, dry metaphysical discourse com that's coming up between <laughs> these, this really um, evocative legend. And also, of course, like he's also promising, like once you get past all the metaphysics of the, you know, there's like 50 pages later, we'll get back to Atlantis, right? It's not like we're going to have, we, there's a bit of Atlantis to frame it and then the metaphysics and then we're done. It's like, no, if you get through all that metaphysics, I really want you to read, you know, this is Plato <laughs> thinking, then, you know, we'll get back to the, that juicy stuff about Atlantis later. So, you know, keep reading, basically, you know, keep, stay tuned. Don't um, tune out. Uh, so I'll wrap up now with this like last thing about this point. So in addition to just Atlantis, though, I noticed this section is also like there, there's like curious things going on. It's like it is described very mythically. He really stretches our sense of time. Like he says, like, actually, where you think Athens began, there's like literally thousands and thousands of years before that, which you've forgotten. And then there's this huge sense of space. He's saying like beyond the Mediterranean, there used to be this giant continent in the Atlantic, what we know as Atlantic Ocean. And um, I guess that's related, right? Because Atlantis, Atlantic Ocean, anyway. <laughs> and that enabled us to go to continents beyond the Atlantic because um, people were able to tra you know, safely travel to the lands beyond, but we aren't anymore. And also how there's so much in this section about like the cyclical. So like there's the literal cycles that they describe, you know, cycles of destruction and creation over thousands and thousands of years. But there's also like, there's these strange echoes in, in this whole section well, Critias, for instance, there's an old Critias, and there's the you know the current Critias who's speaking. And there's an old Critias. There's discussion of like um, 
what what did they call it the um the patron goddess Athena who both created Athens and this other Egyptian city where Solon was there's how Critia says that the Republic that Socrates described just curiously evokes the one he heard about you know which is how they're going to put Socrates Republic into motion there's a lot of prologue before Critias got to his story and they kept promising that they're going to tell us about the greatest thing that Athens has ever done or something like that. And <laughs> they say that, I, I don't know, I feel like they say this like several times. It's like a promise that's like, I'm like, who is it? when are they going to finally tell us? So all this stuff about like these great stretches of time, these great sense of vast distances and of space and time of these deeper cy- cycles. Um, I think Klim mentioned the word like subliminal or something early on. And I think that's sort of what this sort of prologue before the metaphysical stuff does. It sort of mm-hmm. creates us, it sort of sets a, sets a kind of tone. I think that's what the word Klim used to um, that sort of evokes like wonder and prepares us to want to read the metaphysical stuff. And eventually we'll get to Atlantis again in the next dialogue. So anyway, sorry, mm-hmm. I, I'm done. Well, that's great. I love the way that you said that he's trying to maybe stretch our sense of time and space with this. And you referred to cycles and history uh, echoes in history. And I think that was really interesting use of kind of metaphors, maybe. Um, and also the idea of of giving us a sense of the metaphysics of the universe or enticing us to think about the metaphysics of the universe. And again, this is something that the soul does. And I think, yeah, the, the question of time is very important here because we'll see in our next session in two weeks in Uh, around 37E, I think it is, there's a discussion about the nature of time. And time is a continues to be a very mysterious thing 2,400 years later now. uh, What is time is a very significant question that uh, I think in the context of quantum mechanics, for example, is not settled. And so I think that's a very important thing that's maybe being introduced here is the nature of time and the fact that uh, there are these events that destroy human memory over time, but that doesn't mean that the events are actually erased in the history of the universe. They're actually stored somewhere in the universe. And so the priest is saying, well, it, they're actually stored in this place in Egypt because it's not susceptible to fire and water damage. But we know that you know there are actually these events that wipe out civilizations. Uh, it'll actually talk in another section about rocks from space that come down and and hit the earth and cause great fires. And we know that that happened 66 million years ago near Chicxulub, Mexico, that uh, that asteroid is supposed to have, or is thought to have wiped out the reign of the dinosaurs on earth. So it's interesting that that's being talked about 2,400 years ago, like these cycles of time. So time is not maybe linear here maybe time is circular it's it goes in cycles not not a straight line so that could be very important i think to understanding the universe so yeah. Hey, just quickly yeah, just yeah. Briefly, yeah yeah just very briefly yeah something you mentioned um so regarding this the, the cycles and the deeper patterns that seem to be evoked like both on the literal level but also just sort of subliminally like in how this section sort of repeats things and there's there's these strange echoes throughout the section of in how they're talking about things actually i think this this itself could be intimately tied with the metaphysics and preparing us to be interested in the metaphysics because these cycles are sort of evoke the sense that there are deeper patterns involved it's expanding our sense of both the space and time and it's evoking the sense that despite all this huge vast sense that of space and time that's generating us this feeling of wonder in us there might be these deeper patterns involved and what are those deeper patterns than like the metaphysics that's coming up so it's sort of setting the tone preparing us to be curious about what's coming um, from Timaeus mm-hmm for sure. And and as you said, you know, Timaeus uh, goes on at length and quite detailed geometry, actually, you know, which we'll we'll see next time uh, that starts next time uh, we, we meet. And it's very interesting, you know, to wonder whether he is actually describing the actual universe that we live in, you know, and this is the second question that I wanted to address today is what they say at 28A, can we actually defend that with modern physics? So it's interesting, you know, is and again, you know, if if time is circular, then knowledge doesn't necessarily just continue to increase over time. It can go in cycles. And so maybe they knew something back then that we're just kind of rediscovering now. So interesting thought. So let's go to Brenda. Welcome, Brenda. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
When I was reading this section, the idea that struck my mind was that Greece indeed did go through, you know, the dark ages between around 1200 to around 800 or so BC. And there's a validity then in what the priest is saying that there is this lack of knowledge. But I wondered also if it was, if it's a setup for, um, not a setup in a negative way, but a setup to introduce the one of Plato's teachings of, um, uh, you know, the uh, the forgetting that when we are born, we forget all that we knew before. So anemnesis, I think, is his word for it. Um, and our job in our life is really one of remembering what we previously knew. And that does indeed fit in with the notion of the cyclic pattern in nature or in in our ex human experience, rather than the one that we currently hold in the West now, which is that we progress. We don't, you know, we, we're always going forward. So that's what struck me when I read this and very much piqued my interest in where it was going to go from here, because this one is like, this idea was like going back to the ground and um, being a bit critical of lofty thoughts that one might have. So I think it's a great setup. He's presenting the two, you know, two opposing ideas that both um, have validity, um, Atlantis in the sense that, um, you know, it's an ideal and we all strive for ideals, but then this practical matter that's being um, introduced here of um, kind of bringing, bringing, the, bringing the thought back down to the ground, to the real practical literal level. So I just wanted to share that those were my thoughts when I read this section. I thought that was a great section of saying that the Greeks are young in soul and thinking to myself that, yeah, they they might be because they lost 400 years of um, <laughs> who knows what happened then. Thank you. That That's wonderful, actually. Uh, you, you really touched on a number of things. And, and actually, you know, at, at 34B, which we'll see in two weeks, um, Timaeus actually says that at its center the universe has a soul. Uh, and that's, that's another thing actually that was said in the dialogue, the philobus that we covered last season, um, that the universe itself has a soul. So I think you, you pointed to, this could be a setup for understanding that the soul is always there in the universe. Mm -hmm. And this is something that very, you know, platonic is according to Plato, the soul never dies. Like the body will die, but the soul is eternal. That The soul goes on forever. And understanding that theory or, or thought, then I think maybe you're right that this could be a setup for understanding how the soul remembers. And brings me back to the very first dialogue of Plato's that I read, the Mino, uh, in which Socrates says, all knowledge is recollection. So I think you, you said very well that, you know, the, the soul is born into a new body, but it has knowledge from before that it's forgotten when it's born into the new body. And its job is to discover that knowledge. I love the way you said that. And that's our task in life, maybe. So uh, yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, I, I think when we talk about the next section of this, uh, when we get to discussing 28A, that eternal realm of being, that would be where the soul is. The everlasting soul would be in that realm. But we, our physical bodies, are in the realm of becoming, which is the the realm of the physical. So, um, so that's wonderful. I love the way you you describe that. And we'll go to Klim. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think I I agree with the idea that the the concept that they had about the time back then was more of a circular nature, and then there is something that that can be maybe retrieved from the, the prior cycles somehow, uh, especially considering that the universe is a, is a living being in, in their understanding. Um, I just wanted to maybe add one additional point uh, because I'm, I'm trying to stay as, as, as close as possible to the text that, that we are discussing at the moment and, and going back to uh, that idea of setting the stage and kind of emotionally providing some kind of emotional impulse right for, for the to the further discussion um all this mention of the the prior history and the disasters that befell on the human beings before them and the loss of knowledge 
it almost uh, it, he almost like subconsciously su suggests there that we need to rely on something that doesn't have that na nature of change. We need to find uh, something that that you know perhaps there's something that doesn't change, and then if we find that, then maybe uh, you know we'll protect ourselves in the future of, uh, against certain disasters you know maybe we'll be able to avoid those uh, so it's it's really like a practical angle there but it's also emotionally charged i think because because they they do start with the great history prior wars they talk about the warring clans and then how to raise children and it's almost like they're preparing for the Noah's Noah's Ark there in a way, but in in a symbolical way, right? Let's arm ourselves with knowledge. Let's uh, find the tools or the means to protect ourselves or be in a better position. And then, what is a better way than figure out the the rules of the of the universe, maybe, or the Creator? So that that's my uh, small addition to that. That's a great addition, actually. Thank you for raising the idea of knowledge and knowledge having to be, you know, if, if you have knowledge, you have to rely on something that doesn't change. You have to have knowledge of what is, not what is becoming, because what is becoming is always changing. So how can you know something that is always changing? You, you need to grasp onto something that is more eternal. And this is, again, what they'll say in 28A is that that realm of being, which is eternal, that's the realm of the intellect that that's where the mind goes to look for the knowledge that that's it has that eternal grasp on things uh, as opposed to this realm of becoming that we physically inhabit where our physical senses are just grasping the inputs of energy as energy changes right but that doesn't deliver any knowledge to us knowledge is where we take all of that and we we tie it to more eternal things and we'll see actually in four weeks from now where Timea starts to tie that to the famous Platonic theory of the forms. So so that, that's great. I think that you brought knowledge into that and finding something that doesn't change. Knowledge would have to be of that uh, to be to be reliable. And, and we want reliable knowledge. And that's very practical. How, how do we rely on something and we look for something that's changeless? And I also wanted to mention both what you said, Clem, and, and what Brenda said, I think points to the question of memory. How does the universe preserve memory? Modern physics tells us that the universe operates with a law of conservation of information. And so memory is of information. And so that is conserved. So when we're going to construct the universe in this dialogue, we have to allow for memory to be preserved in that universe that's going to be constructed. So that's an important point, I think. So thank you. And we'll go back to Darren. Yeah, there's a lot in, in the small section we read today. There's a lot of times where to evoke this idea of memory. So it's one of these deeply embedded themes in this section where, you know, they're not, they're not explicit about it, but like even the very beginning, right? Like they talk about in the very first page, they talk about like something about remembering or something. I forget exactly what, but um, yeah, like um, Timaeus talks about how uh, Socrates better remind them what they talked about yesterday. So it's more firmly fixed in their minds and so on. So yeah, um, there's <laughs> it's one another thing that's uh, recurrently being evoked. I wanted to just bring up before we move on to the more metaphysics stuff when Timaeus jumps in, I want to mention another way, I think a kind of curious way in which the Republic is related and Atlantis is related to um. The, the metaphysics and the creation of the universe. I actually found this kind of amusing because we hear Critias's proposal about how, you know, they're going to draw this kind of analogy between Atlantis and the really ancient Athens, ancient, ancient Athens, ancient for them. <laughs> so um, the doubly ancient Athens and the Republic that Socrates describes. So then they can put the Republic into motion and see if it actually works and whether it's um, admirable and so on. So they're like, okay, yeah, let's do this. Socrates is like, great. <laughs> and then like Critias casually mentions, well, to get started, why don't we you know, hand the reins over to Timaeus, who will begin by talking about the beginning of the universe. I mean, I thought I found this kind of hilarious because it's like, okay, we're going to describe the ancient, ancient Athens. But then apparently you know, he casually, you know, hands the conversation over to Timaeus, who's going to start way back to the very beginning of the universe. <laughs> So he just sort of casually drops this of like, oh, okay, I guess that's where we have to start. 
I, I personally found that amusing, but maybe there's like a deeper point here too about if you put things into motion, there's this idea of like how one cause has a previous cause. And in order to understand that cause, you have to go to the, the, the cause before that. So you have to um, do this whole progression so that if you want to put the Republic or, you know, ancient, ancient Athens into motion, the Athens of, you know, 10,000 years ago into motion, then you can't just start there. You know, you, you can't just start there and just sort of, you know, assuming things and putting things into motion. You have to go to the very, very first cause, and then you'll understand what it means to put the Republic or ancient, ancient Athens in motion. Although, uh, like, I thought it was both strange and a bit amusing how Critias hands over the reins to Timaeus to start with the beginning of the universe. But maybe there's also a deeper point about how, like, if you want to understand the empirical world, you know, that's actually instantiated in space and time in the deep sense of understand <laughs> um, and not just have opinions about or superficial opinions about, you have to go to the very first cause. So maybe, so maybe that's another way to answer your, the question you posed at the beginning, James. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And, and that's a great point because they will talk in this dialogue about how everything comes to be from a cause. So things don't just appear spontaneously. There's always a cause and effect. And that's time when you think about it, isn't it? That time is just a sequence of cause and effect, always starting with cause and then going with effect. So what was the first cause, as you say, Darren, I think that was a great point to make. What was the first cause? And so to understand what causes people to behave in the way they do in any sort of political or social organization, uh, ultimately, uh, I think you put your thumb right on it, is that you have to go ultimately back to the first cause and, and the first principles, which is what happens in a dialectic is you, you, we, and this is kind of what we're doing now in this kind of dialectical process where we're looking for first principles. And so that was, that was a great way of framing it. I really liked that. Yeah. So just very quickly. Yeah. So like, so to answer the question, like how do we put the Republic into motion and to understand, you know, how it operates and what it's, what its effects are. Well, first you have to go back to, you have to put the universe in motion, basically. You have to go you, in order to understand how any one thing is in motion. You have to understand this whole, this whole darn universe. That's right. And there's a lot, and there's a lot of motion in the universe. And, and certainly if we divide the universe into those realms of being and becoming, which we'll see shortly, the realm of becoming is in constant motion. And that's hard to, motion is a hard thing to, to deal with. It's easier to deal with two-dimensional templates, but uh, when you put things into motion in three dimensions with one dimension of time, so you have four dimensions, things become difficult. And that's where maybe some of the geometry and mathematics come about. And Plato was a geometer, so, so that's great. Um, so we'll go to Roger. Yes, thank you. Um... So when you say cause and effect and that everything has to follow this this sequence, are you saying that there is nothing random and everything is deterministic? And are we joining here what Leibniz's idea of that everything was created and pre-designed by, let's say, God, the creator, and nothing can change? because there is no intervention in between. Once the motion is set, everything will have to follow. And in my opinion, would be the laws of nature. And that's how things evolve. And there is nothing really you can do. Is that what here? Are we joining that similar idea with Plato? That everything is predetermined once the motion once everything is set in motion then things will will follow but and, and i'm glad you asked that question thank you for that uh, because they will say in the dialogue as i said everything comes to be from a cause but i think very much not that all causes in the universe are established at the outset i, I don't think that they're saying that um, in fact i think they're saying quite the opposite that the universe is this mixture of infinite causes and I think, uh, you know, our job in life, as Brenda said earlier, is to piece together the path that we want to follow, is to find the knowledge that will take us to the path of cause and effect that we choose. It's very much not predetermined. It's not that the original cause necessarily leads to everything else that's happening right now. Um, I think it's just, they're, they're trying to say, here's how we set the stage. Here we, here's how we create this universe of infinite potential. 
and nothing is written in advance. It's just, it's a universe of infinite potential. And it's this very difficult mixture that Timaeus will describe the geometry of it, a very difficult mixture, but it's a mixture that allows for that infinite potential and infinite numbers of causes and effects. And we are actors on that stage and we're writing the play. The play isn't written for us in advance. We are the ones who are writing the play. And that's why Socrates is so concerned about the soul and knowledge and understanding knowledge. And in fact, in the Republic, he talked about the divided line of knowledge, you know, sort of starts at belief, goes to opinion, then then knowledge, and then wisdom. So there's four levels of knowledge. And, and our job, you know, is to find our way along that divided line of knowledge. So it, it's not that it's written in advance, uh, I think, but it, it was it's a great question. It's It's certainly, I think, you know, the original cause but that original cause doesn't mean that we're locked along one single path. I think there's infinite paths. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying the yeah. contrast. It's a very sharp contrast mm -hmm. with Leibniz's idea mm -hmm. that yeah. we are free as opposed right. to not having the choice. Thank you. Right. And I think that's that's Socrates is really so concerned that we understand our freedom and that we exercise our freedom with knowledge and not use sort of some sort of random senses to guide ourselves, that we guide ourselves with knowledge. Uh, let me read this next section. This is from 24E to 25D, where the priest continues talking to Solon and addresses more directly Atlantis. So the, the previous section that I read was just the introduction to that. And so this is more particularly about Atlantis, which Darren mentioned continues in the dialogue, the Critias. And we'll get maybe to that dialogue this season. So this is again, 24E to 25D, the priest speaking to Solon. Now, many great accomplishments of your city recorded here are awe-inspiring, but there is one that surely surpasses them all in magnitude and excellence. The records speak of a vast power that your city once brought to a halt in its insolent march against the whole of Europe and Asia at once, a power that sprang forth from beyond, from the Atlantic Ocean. For at that time this ocean was impassable, since it had an island in it in front of the strait that you people say you call the Pillars of Heracles. Now on this isle of Atlantis, a great and marvelous royal power established itself, and ruled not only the whole island, but in many other islands and parts of the continent as well. What's more, their rule extended even inside the strait, over Libya as far as Egypt, and all over Europe as far as Tyrrhenia. Now one day this power gathered all of itself together, and set out to enslave all of the territory inside the strait, including your region and ours, in one fell swoop. Then it was, Solon, that your city's might shone bright with excellence and strength for all of humankind to see. Preeminent among all others in the nobility of her spirit and in her use of all the arts of war, she rose first to the leadership of the Greek cause. Later, forced to stand alone, deserted by her allies, she reached a point of extreme peril. Nevertheless, she overcame the invaders and erected her monument of victory. She prevented the enslavement of those not yet enslaved, and generously freed all the rest of us who lived within the boundaries of Heracles. Sometime later, excessively violent earthquakes and floods occurred, and after the onset of an unbearable day and a night, your entire warrior force sank below the earth all at once, and the Isle of Atlantis likewise sank below the sea and disappeared. So that's the legend of Atlantis. And the dialogue, the Critias will go on to explain some specifics of that city of Atlantis. So this legend Plato brought to us 2,400 years ago, and it continues to inspire people. People are out there looking for signs of Atlantis. Where was Atlantis? You know, there's many theories that still persist. And, you know, maybe to come back to Roger's question, here is where maybe knowledge comes into play. So there was this great power called Atlantis, what set out to enslave people all over the continent. And yet Athens managed to survive. And maybe it was through the use of knowledge that Athens survived against this great force. And so maybe there is some sort of understanding or lesson here in this that we need to appreciate the power of knowledge, not just the power of military might or technological might as Atlantis had, but the power of knowledge itself. And the universe is one that allows for the power of knowledge. And so how do you create a universe in which this knowledge can survive, in which knowledge can survive 
through all time uh, in spite of these destructive events. So here's a story of Atlantis that was destroyed by a great natural force of earthquakes and floods. So th these things happen and they wipe out memory, but how do we rediscover that memory and exercise it with knowledge to deal with situations like civilizations coming along and trying to enslave us? So Darren, your thoughts. I just want to mention this little thing I thought of just now. First time I've ever had this thought. <laughs> um, I recollected something. Um, yes. <laughs> anyway, um, which is that there's actually something quite eerie about how this uh, very ancient Athens being described, Critias says, is very similar to the Republic that Socrates happened to describe. Like, I forget exactly the term he used, um, but it was like some like serendipitous agreement that it just happened to be so similar to the story he heard. So this relates to what I said earlier about how like this is another one of these eerie echoes that comes up, although this one's particularly peculiar and eerie. And, and I was saying how this like evokes in us, the reader, a, like a sense of wonder and curiosity about wanting to maybe try to figure out what these underlying patterns are, because like it seems like things are strangely repeating. But maybe there's a more literal way and direct way in which it's related, because we know that the really ancient Athens was founded by Athena, presumably based on some kind of you know form or pattern in order to function well. But maybe then it's not coincidence that although Socrates had no like direct empirical knowledge of this really ancient Athens of like 10,000 years prior, maybe it's not an accident that when Socrates thought he was coming up with the Republic on his own, you know, devising it through just reason, reasoning, that he just happened to recreate uh, the really ancient Athens, although he had no like empirical knowledge of it, but there is like this germ of reason that's really deep that was both the foundation of the really ancient Athens and also the foundation of Socrates' creation. Because ultimately, in so far as Socrates is a rational human being, they have the same sort of source. So although it's sort of at the level of just the text, it's sort of this eerie sort of coincidence that Critias is describing, but maybe at the more deeper fundamental level, it's also maybe there's a literal way in which it's not an accident that Socrates just happened to come up with a theory of the state that just happens to resemble this really ancient city that mm -hmm. Critias has heard about before. Um, so I, I want to make one more connection I think is really interesting. Uh, again, this I, I just had this thought, uh, something that James said evoked it, which is that it's really interesting that Critias says he was reminded of this story. Like he, he heard the story of this really ancient Athens like when he was 10 years old, so a really long time ago. Solon, I think it was Solon who told him, and he was like, Solon was like 90 or something really old. So again, these vast numbers that, these big numbers at this uh, beginning of this dialogue evokes. But Critias says that he came to recollect this really ancient Athens, the story of this really ancient Athens because of Socrates' story or Socrates' theory of the Republic. And so he spent a night just trying to remember what he heard when he was 10 years old. So again, there's this interesting sort of cycle here too happening. So it, although Crete has heard this really ancient story, but it was evoked by what Socrates just made up, you know, presumably through re through reasoning, but it it somehow triggered Critias' really ancient memory of the real ancient Athens. Like this is another kind of like sort of like secret cycle that's happening here in this. There's, there's a lot of like circular stuff happening here. Um, in this beginning here. So I, I don't know. I just thought of that. I thought that was sort of a cool connection, how like, you know, all, there's all these like cycles and these things relating to one another and how like it was Socrates is presumably made up, although of course it really comes from reason that triggers Critias and Critias then tells how that resembles Socrates. Anyway, yeah, yeah. you get it. <laughs> That's a really interesting thought actually. And, and something that, you know, as you said, you just had that thought and maybe that's the interesting thing about the thought process is it's kind of evoked by a dialectical process, which we're going through, right? So, um, yes, you, you the, evoked it, James. Exactly. Literally. So, literally. but we, we do that to each other, right? So it's, uh, that's another thing. That's another element of the, of the universe, right? Like this was not predestined, right? So um, the fact that you just had that thought, so it was only because we happened to get together and be talking about this. So that's an interesting thing. And, and, you know, you mentioned patterns in time, and I think that's, that's very interesting too. You know, given that when we enter life, the soul doesn't remember what happened before, but then the process of acquiring knowledge is the process of recollection, as Socrates said in the Mino, but also in a number a number of other dialogues as well, that all knowledge is recollection. So, so thanks for that. We'll go to Brenda and then Klim. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, I wanted to um, say a little bit more about Atlantis. Uh, you had mentioned, James, that the other dialogue is the Critias that speaks about Atlantis. And, you know, that's the, the dialogue where he just stops talking at the end. It has no real clear end. But he makes a very important point right there, right before the end. And I'm just going to read like a sentence or two from that dialogue. Sure. So this is way at the end. Yet inwardly, they were filled with an unjust lust for possessions and power. But as Zeus, god of the gods, reigning as king, according to law, could clearly see this state of affairs, he observed this noble race lying in this abject state and resolved to punish them and to make them more careful and harmonious as a result of their chastisement. So that fits in with when we're talking about this knowledge, because to Plato, knowledge is synonymous with the virtues. That is, that's what knowledge means. And so, you know, what he's trying to make a point here is that it isn't just that we live any old kind of life. It matters what kind of life we choose. And true knowledge, the kind that we're supposed to be remembering, is a life of virtue. Mm -hmm. So that's the only point I wanted to make right there. Well, that's a powerful point. I, I, I thank you so much for reading that because I think it really... There's two key things that I took from that is the the lust of the Atlanteans for the material, which, you know, makes me think of the year 2023, where, uh, you know, we have this great technological power and we're using it to gather all sorts of material goods, and yet we are not in a harmonious situation. Uh, and that was the second part of what you what you read, you know, that, that idea of the, this lust for the material uh, leads to some sort of disharmony. And... You know, the, the city that they talked about the previous day, the one that was the subject of Plato's Republic, uh, was not a city that Socrates endorsed. You know, we saw that at the beginning of this dialogue that he did not endorse that city. He never once in the Republic said that he thinks it's a great city. In fact, at the end of the Republic, or near the end of the Republic, it was in Book 10, I think, where that great analogy of the cave is brought in where you know he talks about the prisoner in the cave looking at images on the wall and thinking those images are reality so what is reality right and you know so this i think that what you're saying i think that that part that you read really talks about this need for harmony and understanding what reality is um, and that's that's a great thought that I think we need to keep in in mind. You know that uh, th there's so much echoes of the Republic all through this dialogue, and that that's certainly one of them. You know, including the end of the Republic, where that great myth of Ur, which is really interesting, it reminds me of what you said, Brenda, earlier about the souls arriving in the current life and forgetting what they knew in previous lives. Well, that myth of Ur, Ur was a soldier who died in battle. This is right at the end of the Republic died in battle and was brought back to life. And he tells the story uh, because he somehow was able to remember when he was brought back to life. He tells the story of the souls in the, the plane of souls, and they're made to drink the water of forgetfulness, I think it's called. And then they're allowed to choose whatever life they want to live in the next life. But once they make that choice, it's irrevocable. They have to live that life. And he tells the story of a soul that chooses to be a tyrant and then later regrets it. So um, yeah, very, very interesting connections here. Very interesting connections here. So thanks. And Clem. Okay. Um, I just wanted to touch on what uh, Darren mentioned. And then surprisingly, Brenda also mentioned similar topic, although more in passing, but I'm wondering if it may have uh, more to it than just uh, in just something uh, that, that is a, maybe a tribute to a cultural tradition or their cultural settings back then. And, and specifically, I'm talking about the topic of gods, gods of, let's say, a particular city like Athens. And I believe uh, Athena was also goddess of the counterparts uh, city, although maybe under a different name of the, the city in Egypt. Uh, and so it almost looks like we're talking about the war between deities those that uh so brenda mentioned zeus also right and and i wonder if that also can be somehow linked to the discussion on the technology because we i mean in our times we live in this hollywood culture 
uh, where, you know, God's constantly fighting each other. We see all these, you know, comics, the Marvels and, and so on. And then there may be something to it. I mean, where do these people who make all these uh, motion movies, where do they draw their energy from or their, you know, their, their ideas, uh, their pictures? So obviously from the myth, right? But I guess it's more of a question to everybody. Why do you think gods are mentioned in this discussion? It almost looks like Socrates and others are, are kind of weaving this topic into their, you know, what's going to become uh, a metaphysics, a discussion in, in ontology or metaphysics. But they're not, they're starting with all different topics, including the goddess of Athens. It's almost like they're giving them their proper place, their praises, and all, the, all those cultural things that they almost like oblige to mention, like it's almost like a prayer before the, you, you sit to eat. So is it that, is it just that? Or is that a source of knowledge? Not just the protection, but also like a power that you go to? Or is that, um, what? how do they view, I guess, those, the you know, the, the deities? what role they play so if if let's say if you are not a philosopher during those times it may it would make sense to you to bring gods into the discussion because that's pretty much all you know that that's your that's your world you you deal with the, the myth but the philosophers including from the the pre-socratics right they try to kind of move away from that uh they they try to build their universe that i guess the physical or the, the universe of rules of laws in the, in a more rational way but yet they kind of they they bring gods back into the picture so my question is what what's your what's your take on that what what role does that whole topic play in in the discussion and why people like socrates for example would would even be interested in in going that way Mm -hmm. Yeah, that question makes me think. It's uh, I don't know if I have the answer, and it's something that we can keep in mind as we discuss the Timaeus in in future sessions as well. Uh, it's a really good question. I, I think you know maybe there's a couple of things you ask if you know if the gods are a source of knowledge. Maybe this is going back again to the Republic and the divided line of knowledge, where um, there's you know so the divided line sort of starts a belief and then it ends in wisdom. But belief is unsupported. So maybe the talk about the gods is, you know, an appeal to people to understand that, you know, it's one thing to have belief, but another thing to pursue knowledge and to establish what is actually true and to go beyond just mere belief, you know, and that that's the divided line of knowledge from the Republic. So that could be one of the features of the, the discussion about gods in this and then you know there's the role of the creator which is talked about throughout uh, what time s will will present and i'm just thinking you know there's a part we'll, we'll see this in two weeks um, when time s says that the creator was not jealous of anything you know these gods that maybe were jealous of each other and you know i guess like chronos ate his children and you know there was all sorts of interesting battles between these gods so maybe uh, maybe that's a sign of what actually plays out among humans in in a way, and we ascribe our own behavior to the gods. But he says in the section that we'll read in two weeks that the creator was not jealous and so created a universe that was beautiful and perfect. Um, so there was no need for this, you know, animosity among among gods. So it's a great question. So let's let's pursue that one. I, I don't have the full answer, but it's it's something that's very important in this. I think so. Thank you for touching on that. And Darren, I was just going to respond to Clem, although I think you covered a lot of what I wanted to say. Um, yes, yeah, so related to your first response about evocation of the gods as maybe. Um, attuning us to what is actually true yeah i think there's there's a way in which like athena for instance comes up in which like she supposedly created the very first really ancient athens yeah so there's there's a sense in which when the gods come up it sort of sets our sights on like the higher things or the more deeper realities <laughs> whichever metaphor you want to use so there's that it's like preparatory for what's coming the metaphysics that's coming another thing is that yeah, regarding bring up the gods, I like, I I think Plato 
also has its own idea of God in mind, if you know you want to call it a God. Um, so I think I think that's going to be presented right in this dialogue in in the section that mm-hmm. comes right after this, which is about the um the creator or something, the um craftsman. So I think he's actually presenting, like we see in other dialogues, that he's not like Plato does not like uncritically accept the gods, the famous you know gods of the ancient Greek gods that people believed in. In fact, in Plato's time, a lot of people were were sort of becoming skeptical of those gods, <laughs> not just Plato. So. But like, but Plato doesn't dismiss the idea entirely. I think he's like in in a lot of his works, and I think definitely later on in this one, he's presenting his own idea of you know a much more abstract idea of God. You know, less much less concrete, much more abstract, and very directly tied to like reason. So, yeah, I think may, maybe I don't know that's helpful, but that's be something else that's happening. Yeah, and mentioning the word reason, I think, is very important because that's that's something that. Well, actually, that's a good segue, actually, into the next section. So I'll I'll read this section from 28A to 29A. And this is the one I've been referring to throughout and the one that relates to the second question that I wanted to cover in today's session. And when they talk about the realm of being, the eternal realm of being in this section, uh, they'll say that that's where we make a reasoned account. We make a reasoned account in the realm of being. We cannot make a reasoned account in the realm of becoming. So that I, I like the way you brought reason into that. So let me just read this part here to deal with the second question today. So this is Timaeus talking. As I see it then, we must begin by making the following distinction. What is that which always is and has no becoming? And what is that which becomes but never is? The former is grasped by understanding, which involves a reasoned account. It is unchanging. The latter is grasped by opinion, which involves unreasoning sense perception. It comes to be and passes away, but never really is. Now, everything that comes to be must of necessity come to be by the agency of some cause, for it is impossible for anything to come to be without a cause. So whenever the craftsman looks at what is always changeless and, using a thing of that kind as his model, reproduces its form and character, then of necessity, All that he so completes is beautiful. But were he to look at a thing that has come to be and use as his model something that has been begotten, his work will lack beauty. Now, as to the whole universe of world order, let's just call it by whatever name is most acceptable in a given context. There is a question we need to consider first. This is the sort of question one should begin with in inquiring into any subject. Has it always existed? Was there no origin from which it came to be? Or did it come to be and take its start from some origin? It has come to be, for it is both visible and tangible and has a body, and all things of that kind are perceptible. And, as we have shown, perceptible things are grasped by opinion, which involves sense perception. As such, they are things that come to be, things that are begotten. Further, we maintain that, necessarily, that which comes to be must come to be by the agency of some cause. Now, to find the maker and father of this universe is hard enough, and even if I succeeded, to declare him to everyone is impossible. And so we must go back and raise this question about the universe. Which of the two models did the maker use when he fashioned it? Was it the one that does not change and stays the same, or the one that has come to be? Well, if this world of ours is beautiful and its craftsman good, then clearly he looked at the eternal model. But if what it's blasphemous to even say is the case, Then he looked at the one that has come to be. Now surely it's clear to all that it was the eternal model he looked at. For of all the things that have come to be, our universe is the most beautiful, and of causes the craftsman is the most excellent. This, then, is how it has come to be. It is a work of craft, modeled after that which is changeless and is grasped by a rational account, that is, by wisdom. So that is one of my favorite sections in all of Plato. Uh, There's so much in there. And so the question I asked at the outset is, how does modern physics, or how would modern physics see this? Is is this defensible from a physical perspective? Or could modern science now uh, refute this? So this setup of a changeless, timeless realm of becoming, uh, which is the source for all that becomes. 
So the, the changeless, timeless realm of being is the source for all that becomes. So it's the cause for all that becomes. And our our sense of reason, where we make the reasoned account, a rational account, is in that eternal realm of being. I, I find that actually a very empowering sense, you know, that the there's a physical me, which, you know, comes to be and passes away in maybe 80 years of time, who knows how long I have to live physically, but the metaphysical me, that the mind of me lives in this eternal realm of being and makes its rational account and reasoned account in that eternal realm of being. I find that very empowering, actually, that the metaphysical me has not come to an end. So, so yeah, your thoughts, James? Yeah, is it possible that uh, this kind of eternal realm of being uh, is in the in the it co uh, coincides with the realm of becoming that it is a process of change that is the eternal and mm -hmm. that that pr process of change uh, you know you could say is what is what does not change and mm -hmm. at the same time it is changing and that's that we can rely on that but it's not fixed I mean you have an idea of a fixed sense of being it does not make sense, you know, uh, in accordance with human experience, and it would not be in accordance with uh, a, a you know, creator, uh, the idea of creation or idea of uh, the um, the craftsman is the artist. The artist is constantly creating, taking things, and uh, in the process of change, and at the same time, fashioning into something that appears to. Do not change. I like the way you pointed to human experience and does this realm of being that the changeless, timeless realm of being the, the realm of everything uh, on which all becoming or all, all that is begotten arises from this eternal changeless realm of being. I like the way you said that that doesn't really compute with our daily human experience. And our daily human physical experience certainly is trapped in this realm of becoming. It's 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 begotten. It comes to be and passes away in time. But you know, it's it makes me think our intellectual pursuit of timeless things. I mean, philosophy. I think is is all of that pursuit to get us from this ever changing physical world that we inhabit physically into that more permanent realm that more permanent realm of ideas and the realm where there is no end. And I think that's, you know, whether it's in religious faiths or whether it's in philosophy or whether it's in the pursuit of beauty, uh, the pursuit of beauty in art or in mathematics is the fundamental basis. It, it's the, the kind of permanent timeless basis of things. You know, mathematical beauty is said to be something that does not require, you know, extensive proofs. It, it's it's something that kind of speaks for itself. You know, it, it's it's a minimal proof. It, it's when you reduce things to its minimal basis uh, and and find the first principle. And that that's maybe the sense of beauty that's that we pursue here in discussions like this, but also in that realm of being. Um, so yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, it's if you think of it in terms of mathematics, of course, uh, mathematics is a kind of um you know, a system of, uh, that does not change seems like uh, certain mathematical formulas do not change over time and is universal. But it seems like in the real world, though, there is um, just more than a structure of math mathematics. So there are, there are innumerable structures that are constantly, you know, coming and going into, you know, and being created. And you can see it in art and, uh, and music and so forth that is... Um, constantly you know these musical artistic structures are constantly coming into being and fading away so it seems like it's a constant creative process that uh, that is you know um yeah it, it's true that we're looking for something that's fixed maybe and be, maybe that kind of looking uh, is this motivation for finding something that is fixed and and never changing is part of that creative process as well as as well as to recognize that that's the difference between an artist and uh, and a non-artist. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you, I guess you could be a kind of philosopher that can 
say that, well, you, you've searched and found something that never changes, but there are others who are more uh, creatively inclined to say that, no, we are motivated by searching for this unchanging being, but it's, it's acknowledged that, that we can never know or never be able to settle on that, on what that is. And that's the motivation for creativity. And uh, if you didn't have that, that kind of motivation, then you could be deluded into thinking that you've found something that, uh, that is um, not realistic. Yeah, that's a really interesting thought. You know, I like the way you brought motivation into that and talked about the constant creative process. And that's maybe, you know, again, when we're in this realm of becoming, which is always changing, I mean, I guess we should be grateful that we physically inhabit that realm of constant change, because if we were only able to inhabit the realm of being, then it would be maybe like the question that Roger asked earlier, you know, is everything predestined? Well, I guess in the realm of being, where which is eternal and changeless and, and timeless, that everything would be kind of known in advance. But the fact that we live in this ever-changing realm gives us a chance to improve ourselves and to find knowledge and to seek the joy of knowledge and all of that, which I don't think would exist if we just lived in that eternal timeless realm. Uh, so we are these creative beings inhabiting both realms. Our minds inhabit the realm of being and the body inhabits the realm of becoming. And somehow we have to make sense of all of this. We have to make meaning out of all of the sensory perception of what's becoming. Uh, and, you know, to bring it back to the question of physics uh, that I asked, I think modern physics, it's accepted that everything physical comes into being in a state of order, maximum order, and everything physical eventually winds up in entropy, which is a state of maximum disorder. So I, I think that's maybe consistent with the realm of becoming that Timaeus is talking about here. And you, you pointed out mathematics mathematics is not a physical entity. It's an entity in thought, but not physical. Like there's nothing physical that's called mathematics, but it's something that we pursue in thought. So I think that's evidence maybe of this distinction between these two realms. So mathematics is not part of the physical realm. It's part of the intellectual realm, the, the realm of intelligence, which is the realm of being. So thank you for that. And we'll go to Darren and then Klim. I just want to get back to the question you posed about, you said, um, there's a distinction that Timaeus makes between the infinite realm of being and the limited realm of being bear any relationship to our modern understanding of physics, or can science refute this as a universally fundamental division? I think it's a good question to pose in the context of this dialogue and specifically also putting the Republic into motion. Um, but I think it also maybe ties in with what James, it does also tie in with what James was saying earlier, because like what we end up learning from this section is that Plato, or not Plato, but at least uh, <laughs> um, his characters, I'll, I'll just say, distinguish two different kinds of reasoning about the world or thinking about the world or, or grasping the world. He's not saying that there isn't like maybe art can create maybe the artist or the art can create new kinds of thinking or not. He's not like maybe he's not necessarily denying that just because he's pausing this like realm of this more eternal universal realm of like uh, proportions and mathematics and geometry. Like, but that doesn't really necessarily deny that there could be other kinds of knowledge, but it just not a certain, it's not necessarily universal or certain like, the more abstract kinds that he's proposing. So Critias comes to say, and, and Socrates gives approval. So that's important. <laughs> it's not just a random character or sophist. So the, the character says, the accounts we give of things uh, have the same character as the subjects they set forth. So accounts of what is stable and fixed and transparent to understanding are themselves stable and unshifting. On the other hand, accounts we give of that which has been formed to be like that reality, since they are accounts of what is a likeness, are themselves likely and stand in proportion to the previous accounts. That is, what being is to becoming, truth is to convincingness. And he, he goes on to say that actually in this latter kind of account, which is only like more or less likely or more or less proportionate, 
Um, he actually says it it might actually apply to great many subjects. Um, and, and so we can't expect that these accounts, this latter kind of account, to be perfectly consistent and accurate, as he says, because there is no like in the realm of becoming in accord in accordance with you know <laughs> the realm of being, of course, which is in forms of becoming. There is no like um surety about it, but we can say it's, we can say accounts are more or less likely, but it doesn't mean that there are no standards because likelihood is also is still a standard, right? You can give a wildly implausible account, and then there are there are like a very plausible, and then there are very plausible accounts. But regardless of where you are on that spectrum, it's still like categorically different from the kinds of geometric and mathematical knowledge that it, like it sounds like physics to me, but well, but we can leave that question aside. That Plato or uh yeah, well Plato it generally seems to be interested in. And so this relates to the question that Socrates or the task that Socrates proposes that motivates this, supposedly motivates this dialogue, which is putting the Republic in motion. So this distinction is helpful because we learn that whatever account we give of putting the Republic in motion is not the certainty of the ideal, but it's only like more or less probable or likely. So we might have other accounts. We might come up with other ideas. So I, I personally think just in response to that, that question that James posed at the beginning, I think it I think it's helpful to make such a distinction. I think I think much of our knowledge actually uh, much of the creation of knowledge it implicitly does have this distinction in mind. Um, things that are more likely and then things that we think that are like when physicists are working, they think they're discovering the true, you know, sort of mathematical relationships of the universe. So and um and so, uh, yeah, so I think it's a helpful distinction and um, and uh, it's useful and it's not and it doesn't deny that there is a more another kind of account that is based on probability. So I, I think that's important to emphasize. He's not saying that mm. that's like a black hole where you can't say anything about it. Just he says that there are two different kinds of accounts we can give. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and actually the probability is an interesting thing because of. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and Gödel's incompleteness theorems that I've spoken about or we've spoken about multiple times in this podcast, and those are established physical uh, properties of the universe. That knowledge is uncertain. The more you know of a object's physical position, the less you know about its momentum, and vice versa. That's now been uh, scientifically established. And I think that speaks to this uncertainty about the realm of becoming, um, and which you know, we'll, Timaeus will expand on. So certainly that uh, aspect of it, I think, is consistent with physics. And the other part is uh, that I think is interesting about our understanding of physics now, especially in the quantum realm, is that famous double slit experiment that when you look at, at photons of light passing through two slits in a barrier and then scattering on the wall, the act of actually looking at them changes the scattering pattern. So that tells us that there is some connection between the observer and the observed. And, you know, that makes me think of this realm of being where the observer is, like not the physical observer, but the, the mind of the observer resides in this realm of being but the physical observer is in the realm of becoming as are those photons of light in that famous double slit experiment with uh, quantum mechanics, which still is not explained. So, but there is this distinction between the observer and the observed, and we know that. Um, so how can you, if you were part of the realm, if you were part of what's being observed, like if the observer and the observed, if there was no differentiation between them, how would the observer ever get a complete account of what's being observed, right? So I think it's necessary to have that kind of distinction, like the observer and the observed have to be differentiated. And maybe this, uh, what Tamias is talking about is one way of doing that. So. so thanks for raising that. And then, so we'll go to Klim and then Roger. All right. Um, yeah, very interesting um, discussion. Um, I'll try uh, to approach the technology part of that, but just just to touch on it, because I, um, to me, Greeks and their and their metaphys metaphysical views are so much personally so much removed from technology that I don't even know how to that I, I mean modern technology, modern science, that it would be difficult for me to speculate on how they would how would their ideas necessarily 
presuppose or, or, or parallel our modern uh, science ideas. But one interesting thing that I, in this dialogue that uh, drew my attention in, was in how the cognitive approaches are described to these two realms. And it almost looks like well, if it's, if it's uh, the, the realm of change, then it is sufficient to just apply senses to it. So we have five senses. And it almost like it closes the door, like the answer, <laughs> you know, you check that box, uh, you know, the, the question answered, let's move on, which is, a, you know, uh, to a modern science, or let's say to the founders of our modern science would be, uh, com you know, completely opposite. They, they would say, oh, like enough of the, enough of the metaphysical discussion, you know, let's get rid of Aristotle. And we've talked enough about the theology. So let's study nature. Let's study the, the world, the realm that changes because we can formulate the laws that are maybe metaphysical in nature or they're, they're idealistic in some way just by studying the, the nature and in doing experiments and so, you know, theorizing in, in that way and fashion. Um, but, but the Greeks here, they're, they're, they're saying, you know, no, <laughs> there's one realm that, you know, just five senses is enough because there's nothing, almost like it sounds like there's nothing else to answer. It's, it's obvious. I can touch, I can see, I can smell, and that's how I know, and, and that's it. But the world that, I mean, the, the higher realm, let's call it, that's where we need to apply our intellect. That's how we will look into those, uh, you know, hidden, hidden world, hidden forms, the world of deities, maybe the, you know, that uh, the magic world, the, the, the world of principles that are math, maybe that's what they mean, you know, math, um, science, uh, maybe, um, I don't know, maybe astrology, but then again, astrology, is, you have to observe the sky. But but the abstract, the the world of the abstract, right? Be, because I mean, I understand why you would apply your intellect to it, and and maybe fully. Um, well, because you you can't apply your senses to that, so you have to go into the theology by you know mere speculation or by reinterpreting myths. But th that presents a dilemma, right? So they they they're stuck here with the two worlds, the realms that they've just. Uh, cre created, they they proposed, uh, without justifying, without saying what's the reason for that, why you know why it should be two, why not one, you know, or is it one broken into two for ease of contemplation? But I think that's where they the the difference with the modern concept is right. It's we, we have to formulate the metaphysics by looking at the natural phenomena which is as we know changes all the time because we feel like it's not enough to just merely speculate uh and it, it appears that for greeks it was not a not not an issue and that they could just speculate unless i'm, I'm unless i'm wrong and, and we are all wrong in interpreting it like that because maybe what they mean is again it's just uh it's just a trick that a mental trick that they're using. It, actually, the the world is one, the universe is one. It's intelligent. It's uh, a living creature, beautiful creature, uh, or not even creature, you know, beautiful source or creator. But for ease of our understanding, we're just gonna mentally dissect it into two realms. But these are really not two different realms. These are the uh, rather two. Um, poles of the same continuum, uh, sort of like the, the, the rays emanating from the, the, the source of light, like from the sun, for example, right? So you, you could have the source, which is in, you know, there's no doubt that the sun is the source of rays, but then the ray itself, you can look at the, where that ray ends, right? Or the refle its reflection on the, on the surface as distinct from the source in, in that way. But you cannot say that the ray the the ray has a different nature, right? And talking about in Christian terms, there you know the, the natures of Christ and so on, or the the Eastern uh, thought, uh, like the Advaita. Um, so, but it's it's interesting that they're not 
starting from that premise, right? They, they're starting, uh, at least in, in this dialogue, they're just saying, no, we're dealing with two two realms that don't, almost don't intersect. One is not worthy of our <laughs> uh, attention. The other one is where, you know, that's where, you know, we need to apply ourselves because that's where the source of moral beauty and so on is. So these are just the the thoughts in there. And it, it almost creates an, an impression that they're discovering things as they discuss. Uh, they don't have a concrete plan, uh, at least in, in this dialogue. Uh, and they're almost like stumbling in on a, on a cow path rather than going through the, like a straight avenue. And they're like going with torches or the, the, the little lights in their hands trying to figure out feel almost like feel out the, the path in front of them and you know they're, they're not laying concrete answers they're more their, their answers their propositions are more even like questions like could it be this could it be that what if we take the polarity that the two realms concept what do we get out of it if, if we start analyzing so that's uh, these are my thoughts not not much on technology but at least it's it, I try to make the connection to the yeah. modern way of, you know, the modern science or scientific approach. Mm -hmm. that, that's great. And I, I really like the way that you brought the modern scientific method or approach into that. And, and also at the beginning when you differentiated or, or talked about the different cognitive approaches, you know, so this realm of becoming and the realm of being uh, you, you said are two poles. And I, I like the way you said that because it it is the same universe. So it's not, it, they're not to be to be clear about it they're not saying or to Timaeus is not saying that there are multiple universes these are in fact two parts of the same universe and and then he will go on in the next section that we'll see in two weeks to be quite categorical in that that there is only one universe he's very categorical about that so um modern science now is looking at the question of multiverses um, and some physicists hold that that could be possible, but, you know, maybe Socrates would say, well, a multitude of what, um, it would have to be a multitude of something. And eventually there would have to be one thing of which the multitude is a multitude of. So, uh, maybe that's one of the, the questions here. And, and so raising the modern scientific method is interesting because as you said, you can't apply the senses to the abstract, right? Uh, sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell, you, you can't apply that to mathematics. Um, so how do we deal with the abstract? So the physical senses are just bringing in physical data, but that physical data, we don't, we can't make meaning of that without using the intellect. So it's really, it's like a computer receiving data, but then the intellect is what provides the program that um, that makes sense of that or makes meaning out of that data. So I think that's an important point. And, you know, the raising of the modern um, scientific method, uh, which relies on empirical proof, um, I think there are some problems that we may be facing with that method. And it makes me think of an interview I did of a scientist who is looking for dark energy. Um, so she's running a citizen science project where people can go online at Zooniverse and uh, help look for signs of dark energy. So... It was a really interesting interview, and I asked her in that interview how the modern scientific method can deal with uh, empirical proof of something that cannot be visibly or empirically seen. So dark energy uh, is not detectable through any method that we know of. And, and so her answer was, well, yes, then we can infer that dark energy exists by, you know, I think eliminating all of the other probabilities. Um, so... That's it's, I think it's an area that maybe the scientific method might have to adapt to is is these things like dark energy and dark dark matter, um, which cannot be observed. We have no way of observing them. So we have no way of finding empirical evidence of them. And yet we know that they exist. Um, so it's an interesting question that we may have to adapt to our, our scientific methods to. So thanks, Ray. lots of good thoughts in there. Um, so we only have about maybe 10 minutes remaining. So we'll go to Roger and Darren and Clem, and I think we'll have to wrap up our session, which has been a great session. I'm looking forward to our next discussion. We can continue this in our next discussion. Um, we will, and before I forget to mention it, the next time we will 
take another dozen pages or so of the dialogue, uh, and we'll go to 47E uh, in the next session. So we'll start at 30D and go to 47E. So we can continue these these thoughts in, in that session as well. So we'll go to Roger, Darren, and then Klim. Thank you. Well, a lot has been thrown around and <laughs> since I raised my hand and it kind of blurred my thoughts more than uh, than I would have liked to. So I'll, I'll be brief. I think if I understand this paragraph uh, in front of us, I mean, even to, to a small extent, the difference between the being and the becoming when it comes to uh, I mean, these are two different realms or worlds or approaches or disciplines or ways of thinking. And in a simplistic, perhaps, manner, I would attribute the being more to the artistic side of things and the becoming more to the scientific slash mathematical side of things, the way we understand classical sciences. I mean, I'm... Notwithstanding what you have raised, James, the the idea of the observer interfering with the with the observation of what's being observed, and the therefore not everything can be explained in a classical way. But if if we if we look at the way, let's say, mathematics is being applied to explain physical phenomena, then both the math and to a good extent the physical phenomena are conceived as definitely the math is is based on a set of axioms and that's it we go from there and keep building on it and when it comes to the physical phenomena we just follow the laws of nature conservation laws energy momentum mass and so on and we we try to model and then come up with an answer to interpret what phenomenon were we're trying to understand. So it's pretty clear that there it's things evolve and we build on whatever knowledge we have and uh, eventually keep on evolving. Whereas when it comes to the artistic side of things, we don't really need to do that. And I'm not sure, and forgive me for uh, maybe under, I don't want to sound like somebody who's undervaluing the artistic side of things. But if you want to create an an artistic, um, a, a, a work of art, you don't need to go back and try to build on what has been done. So in, in that sense, there is, there is the being to me, as opposed to the becoming. And just to go back to what Klim was alluding to uh, regarding the, the Greeks and the science, I think, yes, they, they may be mixing the two worlds, but they did try to understand science. And when you go back to Xenon and the paradoxes and so on, but they didn't really have the tools that we have since at least Descartes came in. And we began to think logically about interpreting these phenomena for them, like to some extent, part of whatever, what, what James was alluding to, the dark energy and so on, is still like blurry in our head and we can't really get around to model it and put our logical finger on it. Uh, the Greeks were at that stage back be way before Descartes really came in, I mean, I choose Descartes as a point of change. Uh, so I, that's, that's I think, my my thought. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's really good thought. I actually like the distinction that you made of the artistic as being maybe somehow rooted in the realm of being. And that, that reminds me, so I've, in the notes, I put a few excerpts from the Republic, and I put this very short excerpt here at the, the top of the notes, Republic 596B, a number in unity. And that made me think of that. Um, and where uh, Socrates says, then now let's take any of the many's you like. For example, there are many beds and tables, but there are only two forms of such furniture, one of the bed and one of the table. And don't we customarily say that their makers look toward the appropriate form in making the beds or tables we use? And similarly, in the other cases, surely no, for, no, surely no craftsman makes the form itself. How could he? 
And that made me think of what you were saying in the sense that art is is producing images, but the images are based on something. And this, I think, uh, section from the Republic is saying that there's kind of these timeless forms of things. So, you know, a river is a river, but the river takes many different shapes in physical being. But the idea of river is is that form of river that is in that realm of being. And that's what the artist is deriving the art on. So the art, the artist is not making river itself. The artist is showing a river. And similarly, the maker of a bed or the maker of a table is not making bed itself and table itself is making a an image, a representation of bed and table. So, and we'll get into that in the in the context of the theory of forms um, in about four weeks. So, so thank you. I think that was very helpful. Um, so we'll go to, and we just have literally about five minutes left. So we'll go to Darren, and then we'll wind up with with Klim. Okay, uh, I just I wanted to respond to um, Klim's comments earlier. So about these two. Um, I guess, realms of being and becoming. And um, Clint was mentioning how it seemed um, that the realm of becoming here is described as, I'm quoting here, uh, is grasped by opinion, which involves unreasoning sense perception <laughs> and how that might seem <laughs> kind of unsatisfactory. I'll just point out that, so there's two things I want to say about this. Um, one is that this strong distinction doesn't at least originate in Plato himself, right? Because there's been these debates about being <laughs> becoming from way before Plato came onto the scene that Plato is actually just, you know, latching onto. And so this idea that, and this idea that becoming is um, grasped through opinion and unreasoning sense perception. So Plato actually sort of mocks this idea, right? Like he, he sort of, like, cause I remember in a previous um, dialogues we read in this group, I, I I don't remember if it was in the Sophist or if it was the Philibus, but there was this example of when you ask these people, like the people of the Heraclitus camp, like what is knowledge? They won't give you a definition, but like, for instance, the example was what is a tree? And then the person of the Heraclitus, Heraclitus persuasion would like literally run up to a tree and grasp it and like hug the tree and be like, and they'll be like, that would be his answer. <laughs> you ask them, what is a tree? Um, they'll grab, they run to a particular tree and literally grasp it with their body. But like he was, Plato was also sort of like mocking this approach, right? This this extreme approach where everything is literally, literally everything is just becoming. And of course, in the Theotetus, he shows how that's like self it becomes self contradictory. That view and the very I, I personally think the arguments in the Theotetus are very persuasive, um, and brilliant and relied on by Kant and others later on. But anyway, um, so that's my first point. I'll say like the 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 strong distinction is not from Plato himself. Other people have this idea that there's that the other people actually like positively approve the idea that it's un unreasoning sense perception that we grasp becoming. Um, I don't know if it's Plato's idea though, but he does like um he does comment on it. And the second thing is that I think what James said earlier about um these realms being of the same universe, which is emphasized a bit later on in the reading. But there is only one universe, and these are just sort of a metaphys a metaphysical division within our like actual visible and tangible universe. I, I quote vis visible and tangible from the text um, today. So it, it doesn't actually describe like two different worlds. It's still like one world which has these two aspects. So and um, so Klim mentioned how it, it might be a somewhat unsatisfactory that these two realms are so cleanly divided and they don't seem to intersect well i think for plato first of all like i i don't we have we don't have the full picture yet i haven't read the entire timaeus so i i personally don't even know but like i think for plato they do intersect because of what i know from other dialogues so we see the strong distinction being made in other dialogues but plato always like especially in the very very late dialogues of what we know to be plato's like very late dialogues towards the end of his life um like in this I, i'm thinking of the statesman I'm thinking of the philibus on pleasure and the st statesman on the ideal, on a different dialogue and a different kind of ideal state in the, in the real world. Um, in the end of those dialogues, he does bring these realms together. He said, he said it's neither one or the other. So he actually gives really practical, practical advice in the philibus about the relationship between pleasure and reason that like 
he says as a as like in the real world as a practical human being like we can't have we can't literally like divide ourselves this way and like live one or the other so he actually has practical actually very kind of pluralistic kinds of advice for like you know figuring out like what is the proper balance between pleasure and reason <laughs> he's not like ideological it has to be all pure reason like he's totally in so anyway i'm just saying that like Although like he does different things in different dialogues, but in other, in, uh, in especially in his very very late period dialogues, he does show how these, at least in our own lives, in 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 terms of practical ethical advice, that they do have to that we do have to find ways to for them to combine them in ways uh, for human being. Um, and just a, just a last thing here, so he says he does say that the kinds of knowledge we we can ask for is only human knowledge. He says that in the reading today, I think. Um, and we shouldn't ask for anything beyond that. So anyway, I'm done. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, thank you. And and I, I like the fact that you raised Heraclitus, which I hadn't thought about in the context of this dialogue, but you know, the Plato does constantly refer to Heraclitus through a number of dialogues. And I think that idea that Heraclitus uh, had that everything was in flux, maybe as you're saying is, you know, maybe everything in the realm of becoming is in flux, but not in the realm of being. And so I think that's an important distinction that uh, contrast to, to Heraclitus and that, that kind of view. Um, so thanks for raising that. And so we'll go to Klim and Klim bring us to a conclusion and we'll set the stage for our next discussion in two weeks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, very quickly here. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you, Darren, for trying to clarify and expand on on the uh the the two realms and and, and the greeks and um yes i you know what i my intuition kind of tells me that um and first of all i'm not i'm not knowledgeable in the original greek texts that that much that's why i'm i'm doing this um session and i'm looking forward to to it but i i have a i have a mm, a sense uh an intuition that they they like to play with concepts right so it's not what whenever they say two realms or they pose a certain concept or an idea i don't think it's final it's like they want they sort of juggle the, the ideas and see what's what's going to come out of it the, the greeks were famous for uh entertaining different concepts right and we're not even touching the uh the materialists right we're we're, we're just dealing with the aristotle and, and plato um, and uh, Socrates at, at the moment. There are other schools uh, of thoughts there. So to me, it makes sense that, that there are incons appearing inconsistencies in, in their discourse. Um, and just, just because I think they are not trying to, re to solve something in, in one go. They're just probing, they're, they're, they're going in different directions, and they're also trying to formulate the language because they don't have a terminology <laughs> they're they're formed they're they're discovering it and forming it as as they go uh and and it's you know totally excusable um and one other thought on the idea of that like the how this may touch on our modern views um and then james like you, you mentioned the dark matter and the difficulties that the modern science uh finds uh, as it, it tries to move forward uh in the, in the quantum physics and, and things like that uh, yes i think i think uh and I, I know i'm not a scientist but we may be there's a there's a, a general feel in 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 the science scientific community right that we're approaching certain boundaries certain limits that for which we don't have tools or, or the apparatus to to move forward and one thing and it's, this is obviously not my idea uh, but something that I hear quite often is that whenever you talk about matter, in other words, the the second realm of of the Greeks, I guess I guess we can draw that parallel in our modern terms and, and sort of equate that at least at least theoretically to our idea of matter, the the world, the realm of matter. Uh, whenever you just focus on that and try to quantify it and explain it, uh, just by focusing on the matter as as opposed from from the spirit right eventually you run into that the, the rabbit hole of <laughs> splitting the particles and never reaching the bottom uh and then so that creates a, a sense that well if it's if it's going to become an endless process like that and then we just create more and more abstract mathematics and throw that on on, on the wall and see if it explains the reality 
there's there's a feel that it's it's not going to explain the reality and that it will just keep falling down that rabbit hole and try to plug you know the plug the uh or patch patch the holes as as they come in 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 uh as we discover them or the holes that we fall into doing our you know or keeping with our modern scientific approach um and so from that point of view the the matter itself right it, it doesn't exist because why because it it keeps breaking and never reaches the bottom uh so there's not nothing tangible there's no like uh, okay democritus w- would say atoms you know atoms there you, you cannot you cannot split them something indivisible concrete this is the the base of our world well it, it just doesn't appear given the the modern science right it just doesn't it's not as clear anymore that there is a bottom to our material world, which leads me back to this concl- sort of the parallel to the biblical nothingness, right? Out of which the, the God created uh, the world. Because if you think about matter, what is matter? Well, it, it, theoretically, it should be something tangible, but we never seem to hit the bottom so and and because of that well there is nothing really that we can hit it's just patterns of something that breaks into other patterns and there's no tangibility there there's nothing that our senses can feel or a a particular tool that we uh like a microscope for example or Mm -hmm. other tools that we create that can that actually sense so from that point of view you could i could see how greeks let's say that they were say they were smart or they had some access to some ancient knowledge they could say Yes, it is. It's almost as it doesn't exist because it it always changes, and therefore it doesn't exist. So let's turn our minds and our intellect to something that does exist. So I'll, I'll end here. Yeah, well, that that's great. And and I think recalling again what I said earlier about Heisenberg and and Gödel, and that uncertainty. And and I like the way you said that we're maybe approaching a boundary of knowledge. Uh, and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle certainly says that. There is no perfect knowledge uh, of uh, either the position or the momentum of any physical particle. I mean, I would say, and and really interesting actually relating to that is the quantum itself. So the quantum is the smallest amount of energy that can either cause change or be changed. And that's interesting in the context of cause and effect, because the quantum, therefore, is the smallest agent of cause or effect. And the thing about the quantum is that every quantum is like every other quantum. And so in terms of understanding how quanta work, multiple quantum, um, we need to understand, as you said, the patterns. It's not it's not the operation of one because one is every, like every other. It's how they get together and the patterns they form when they get together. And I think that's what uh, is being you know, d- debated and, and looked at in quantum physics. But I think the the philosophy of the quantum itself is that it is the smallest agent of cause or effect. And we talked about that in relation to time at the beginning. Um, and the fact that everyone is like everyone, every other. And so we can't differentiate that realm of the quantum. Um, so how do we do that? As you said, when when we find a, a barrier or, or a boundary to knowledge, we go into that infinite realm of being and uh, explore, look for the first principles. So that was a great way to bring today's session to a conclusion. I I really like that. So thank you for that. And thank you to everybody for participating today. It's, you know, we've had a great discussion as always. I think so many points brought out that, you know, uh, we hadn't thought of before maybe and and things certainly that I've learned from, from this discussion. So I'm really interested to, proceed into the next section. Uh, as I said, we'll, we'll uh, go to 47E next time in two weeks and see what happens in that section um, and tie it to today's discussion and keeping in mind the Republic in Atlantis and how all of that fits in and then how the physics of this idea of being versus becoming as, as two components of the same universe uh, might actually work. So thank you. Um, I would invite anybody, I'll stop the recording now, but I would invite anybody who would like to stay online for a casual, unrecorded half-hour discussion in Plato's Cafe. Um, you're more than welcome to. And otherwise, those who um, have to leave, if you're you're certainly welcome back in two weeks, and we welcome uh, others as well. So thank you for being here today, and I hope to see everybody in two weeks. Thank you.